Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to let everybody on Zoom know that we still have some people trickling in. We're going to let them take a seat and we'll get started here in just a minute. Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's hybrid meeting and presentation with the Los Alamos Mountaineers. Before we get started, I just want to make everyone aware that tonight's presentation is being recorded. I am Beth Courtright, the Operations Manager here at the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I'm the moder moderator for tonight's talk. I do want to acknowledge all of our wonderful members and donors for their generous support and our partners, the Mountaineers. Uh, for more information about other PEAK and Mountaineers programs, you can visit our websites. I'm going to now pass it to Juliana to start the Mountaineers meeting. Hello. Welcome, everyone. We have a really good presentation today. I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of uh, our lineup for the Mountaineers talks. Uh, this is what we have over the course of the year. Uh, we've got uh, hiking talks, fishing talks, rock climbing, um, a history talk should be excellent as well, um, skiing talks, biking talks, and really good adventurous speakers. And so I hope that you can join us often. And our uh, programs are usually held the fourth Tuesday of the month here at PEAK. So uh, please do come often. And with that, I will uh, pass it off to Tony. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Juliana, especially. Thank you for putting together such a great program for the whole year. So I'm Tony Taylor. I'm the president of the Mountaineers. And this is tonight's um, agenda. We're going to have a, a short uh, overview of our financial status by our treasurer, Cecile Jemez. Um, Bill Podorsky will update us on the uh, climbing school. And uh, then we'll have our trip reports and upcoming trips by uh, Jeff Click, our uh, trip coordinator, and then our main presentation, which is really going to be quite exciting, uh, introduced by Bill Podorsky. So with that, I will turn it over to Cecile. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Cecile Hemes, the treasurer for, uh, for the, the Los Alamos Mountaineering Club. And I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our uh, 2022 uh, finances. Um, so uh, in uh, last year, 2022, uh, most of our income came from our membership dues uh, in the amount of uh, $2,700. And we also received a $900 uh, donation from Triad. So a total of uh, $3,600. On the expenses side, uh, we spent $5,000 um, mostly on gear uh, and more specifically on canyoneering gear. Uh, the club decided to invest in, uh, in new ropes and uh, hardware for canyoneering activities. Uh, we also celebrated our 70th anniversary, so that was part of the, the expenses. And uh, we purchased directors and officers liability insurance. So our, our, we, we did spend more than we um, uh, earned, but that was uh, a decision by the board to actually invest in, in new equipment. So our position at the end of the year was uh, $17,000 in uh, our bank account. Um, just quickly, the, um, so I'm the treasurer, I maintain a ledger, and Per our bylaws, our, all the books are reviewed by a committee, and they uh, reviewed all the books in February, and they uh, concluded that our expenses were um, in line with the, the club's missions and goals. And that's it for me. So I think, Bill, you're next. So I'm Bill Podorsky. I'm the vice president of the club. Uh, in the past, you know, before 2016 or thereabouts, uh, the club vice president was responsible for organizing the climbing school, which is a big deal. Uh, we haven't been doing the climbing school for a few years. I agreed to be the vice president because I wouldn't have to do anything at all. But we decided to have a climbing school again. And we're actually thrilled to do that. This is a tradition of the Mountaineers going back to the 60s or maybe the 1950s. You know, we've modernized it and we decided that this is just beyond our scope as a as volunteers. 
so we've gone into partnership with a climbing uh, guide organization called Mountain Skills, uh, folks who are well known in, in their own uh, right of Taos, New Mexico, and we are <clears throat> we're um, they are providing paid instructors. We are providing volunteers. We are providing some classroom sessions. I think it's a healthy partnership. We have eight students at this year. This year, which is you know, might be a good number to get started on for the for the new format. Um, you know, it's more it's pricier because we're hiring professionals than it was in the past. We've offered scholarships, and we're very pleased to grant a scholarship in the name of our dear departed friend Jan Studebaker to student Isabel Riddle. Um, <clears throat> Sessions will be in the Rio Grande Gorge. They will be up at Tres Piedras. Uh, I got a call from uh, Jay Foley of Mountain Skills a week ago saying, have you realized it's still winter and Tres Piedras is at 8,000 feet? So we moved down a couple thousand feet to the Rio Grande Gorge for the initial session. Uh, here in, um, in Los Alamos, in this building, we're holding two classroom sessions, which I think people will find interesting. Tomorrow night, and I understand at this point there's three slots left, there's a hand-on knots and anchors course. We'll give people a piece of rope, a piece of webbing, go through the basic lots, um, uh, knots for, um, for rock climbing. And if you want to get one of those last three spots, go ahead and sign up on the PEAK website. We're going to cap it out at 20. Uh, and then Two weeks later, on Wednesday, the 12th of April, we'll have a canyoneering talk and demo by Dan Creveling in this room. And that is also a peak registration, but not quite as limited in, in participation. Outdoor sessions, as I mentioned, Saturdays through April, we're looking for volunteers to represent the mountaineers at this event to you know, assist and work with the paid instructors. I think we've got some volunteers for this weekend and we'll be looking to get a couple people up there for each of the Saturdays um, through, the, through the course. So we're excited that this is happening. This is a core activity of the mountaineers. And um, you know, I'm not a rock climber, I've never been, but I took the course once upon a time, because even if you're, you know, if you're scrambling, if you're going around rough terrain, you know, knowing those basic skills, your bowling, your rappels, might get you out of a spot you didn't, you might not be planning to climb on a given day, but having that skill set might get you through a jam. So let me leave it at that, and we'll move on to the next. Uh, and I think we're up to Jeff and Trips. Okay. So trip report for March, it was a, a light month. Uh, we just had one uh, club trip and that was a uh, cross country ski uh, from uh, Pajarito uh, a ski area to the Valles Caldera Visitor Center. And this is a trip that's been done pretty regularly over the years, but hadn't been done for a number of years. And we had a great turnout. This is actually our lunch spot that was sort of south facing uh, that was melted off and dry, but the Valle was was beautiful, as you will see. We had seven skiers uh, that uh, left from Pajarito, seven snowshoers, uh, led by Olivia Lee, and we also had a group of five, uh, no, six skiers that skied out from the visitor center to join us at our lunch site for a, a little bit shorter trip. So that was a, it was a successful trip where we had 20, uh, 20 participants. This is a this is a, a, a group of five at, uh, I think the most adventurous part is you, when you ski out Cañada Bonita, you then climb out north to Pipeline Road and then you ski down Pipeline into uh, Valle de los Pozos. And that was the most adventurous part of the trip that was uh, uh, fairly icy in some places. We had a, a couple falls and uh, lots of uh, scrambling, uh, but this is a successful crew at the bottom there. And you can see the snow conditions were just perfect in the Valle. It was like perfect skate skiing conditions across the entire Valle. And Ann Sitsagi, who's a, a good skate skier, she was skiing a haul. We were, we were on a beeline to the visitor center, it's about 11 mile ski. And she was just skiing all in all directions around us, just enjoying the terrain. This is in Rincon de los Soldados. Uh, you can see just beautiful, you know, views and uh, and perfect snow. And this is on the uh, uh, on 
Lynn on the final final visitor leg to the visitor center. So that was a great trip. Um, go back one. These are some of the trips we have coming up. We've got the Power Up Winter Series. It's still happening. 6 a.m. Tuesdays at Pajarito while the snow lasts. Um, uh, those, uh, we've got a group of folks that are they're skinning up and skiing down in the morning. Uh, Cabazon Peak on April 18th. Uh, canyon hiking in the Comb Ridge and White Canyon areas. That's a trip Bill's leading uh, here in a few weeks. Deer Creek Hoodoo's Llama trip in May. Hiking and fishing in the upper Conejos Valley in July. Uh, Gates of the Arctic uh, National Park in August. That's a trip uh, Tanya Piatras, Piatras is uh, leading. A Middle Fork uh, salmon raft trip with music in September. Uh, a walking tour in Italy in late September and Moab Bike Hike and Explore in uh, November. Uh, I've got an invitation for folks, uh, and it's a trip challenge, and I, I, I ask uh, each of you to consider uh, leading one trip this year. Uh, it can be a very simple day trip. It's an easy way to start. It's a, it's a great way to welcome new people into the group, and uh, no trip is too small. Uh, please feel free to contact me for trip ideas or help in any component of that trip planning. So I, I encourage you to think about that, especially for those of you that are, are joining on regular trips or just doing trips with, with your friend community here in Los Alamos. Consider posting that as a trip with the Mountaineers and making that an option to welcome new people in the community that might not otherwise be familiar with where you might be going. All right, that brings it back to me. So just a few logistics for the presentation before we get started. Our presenters will be taking questions via Zoom chat and also from our in-person audience. Please remember that uh, not everyone in the room here with us has a microphone, so there may be a delay when we're, when we're listening to a question from the live audience, but don't worry, we'll be back on in a second to repeat the question for everyone to hear. And without further ado, I'll hand it back to Bill to introduce tonight's speakers. So I'm very pleased that we have this talk at last. I've been on Jake's case for at least a couple of years <laughs> to get him to come up and do it. And, um, you know, a fishing talk at the Mountaineers. Well, the Mountaineers are sort of a general purpose outdoors organization, adventure in the outdoors. And you might think, well, you know, fishing, you go in a boat, you drink beer. Uh, what does that have to do with really connecting to the wilderness and out of doors? And there is fishing like that. But fly fishing is a sport where you connect very deeply to the out of doors because you're, you're a hunter. You might be a catch and release hunter. I am, but you're a hunter. You're sensing and keyed into the out of doors in a way that you... You never quite are if you aren't looking for something or trying to find something or trying to, you know, a fisherman of whatever IQ is trying to outsmart a fish with an IQ of three and doesn't always do it. Uh, so I think it's very much a sport where you value and enjoy art in the, in the heart of the outdoors and, and quite the, what's appropriate for the mountaineers. Uh, Jake Clements runs a small uh, fly fishing guiding company, out, Artful Angler. Uh, Rob McCormick, also a guide with that company. And I met Jake when he kindly donated to an auction run by Trout Unlimited, raising funds for that outdoor organization, online auction every spring. And I won the auction and paid my piece. And the guide that, uh, that I bought, whose services I bought was uh, Jake Clements. And uh, we met at that point, and we must have been out at least half a dozen times, maybe 10 times since then, because I think he's, he's such a fine outdoor guide, you know, deeply connected to the wilderness, a great teacher, uh, patient with the, oh, Bill, you've got your fly up in that bush again, I'll go get it, thing. <laughs> no worries. And I've, I've learned a lot about, uh, like many sports, that are deep in their technique. You can learn and you can learn and learn. And you know, fly fishing is a sport you can do 30 years. And still, the next time you go out, you're going to learn things that you haven't haven't done before. And uh, <clears throat> Rob, I've been out with a, a few times on the Rio Grande, elsewhere, San Juan River, obscure little uh, streams coming off the Sangre de Cristos on the western slopes of the Sangres learning outrageous techniques, bow and arrow cast, 
appropriate for small streams, little tiny rafts without a bottom, <laughs> appropriate for topping a raft, standing up, fishing, fishing right there. And, um, you know, every day that I've spent with these guys has been an adventure and a learning experience. So, um, of course, I would recommend them, recommend their services, but I think the best way to understand what they're up to and what they do, what they do is to hand the microphone over to them. You know, <clears throat> you know, part of the arm twisting was, we gee, we're not public speakers, we're fishing guides. And I said, okay, you come to the front of the room, you tell lies about fishing for 45 minutes, how hard could that be? <laughs> <laughs> so off to, over to you. Yeah. Great, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Um, thanks, Juliana, as well, for, for uh, inviting us here to speak with you guys. And thank you, Beth, for setting up the talk. And uh, what a cool place to, to speak in. Uh, I've never talked in, inside a uh, planetarium before. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you haven't either. <laughs> yeah, Rob was saying that I think the fanciest place that we've ever done a talk is perhaps in a brewery or a bar. Or yeah. Something like this. And, <laughs> Here we are, a couple of, of trout bums in a planetarium. So who, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, so this is pretty neat. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk today uh, about fly fishing. Um, I guess who can here has fly fished uh, more than three times? More than once. Let's start with more than once. Okay, cool. More than five times. Okay, great. So I'm, it's going to be a kind of basic talk um, introducing you to, to the sport of fly fishing um, kind of how it is with recreation, um, how it kind of naturally turns into becoming a conservationist and conservation, uh, and then as a means for exploration. Um, so we'll touch on kind of basic stuff, um, but feel free to ask questions. We can get as advanced as you want to get because um, we, we love talking about fly fishing. So, um, so if you couldn't tell by now, I'm Rob. This is Jake. <laughs> Um, Jake, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Jake Clemens, born and raised in Santa Fe. Um, yeah, kind of found my love for fishing just in some ponds, fishing for bass and stuff in uh, La Cienega, and um, have taken that all over the world. I've been to Patagonia, um, and mostly just around the United States. But love fishing and love to talk about it. So, yeah, uh, like there's more to me than just fishing, but that's that's the gist. Yeah, I think uh, one thing you should mention is you have a background in environmental sciences. Um, so a smart guy, not just a fishing guy as well. Um, yeah, and likewise, I grew up fishing uh, in a fishing family, uh, mostly in New York and New Jersey, um, and found fly fishing as kind of a younger teenager um, and used that as a vehicle to get out of New Jersey, um, but also to travel around the world. Um, and have guided all over the place from Alaska to Ireland, um, back on the East Coast in the salt, um, and use fly fishing as a vehicle, Russia as well, use fly fishing as a vehicle to, to fish all over Asia and all over Mexico, um, all over Africa. Um, it's just a place that can take, a, a sport that can take you anywhere. Also important to note that Rob is a, one of the most active conservationists that I've, I've met, and um, we're lucky to have him working with our Flangler. So just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, so what is fly fishing? Uh, it sounds like a, a good amount of you know, um, but at its most basic, it's a weighted line for casting. And I brought a fly fishing reel that I can pass around if you had never seen one. So we use that, that weighted line for casting. Uh, it requires some human motion. Um, so Bill referenced kind of sitting in a boat and drinking beer, dunking worms. This is completely the opposite. It's an active sport. Um, and at its best, at least what Jake and I think, it's an active sport because you're traveling down a river, you're traveling up a river or around a lake. Um, so the scenery is also changing pretty regularly. Um, and it, you use an artificial lure or a fly. And here's a box of flies if you've never seen one. And that's a box of nymphs, so the aquatic stage of insects. Yes? <laughs> that's some secret knowledge in some cases. Yeah, you might have to. I don't know. That's uh, that's kidding. in Southern we'll Colorado. To... That's that's within a <laughs> within a an easy shot from here to go fishing. <laughs> uh, um, you, you can 
it's fine. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's a less penis. Um, and the fly can be fished on the surface or or below. So that box traveling around are, are nymphs. So that's the aquatic phase. Um, and we're using we're using the flies, the artificial flies, to mostly imitate things that are natural. Um, but there's more and more so we'll do things that are unnatural just to kind of spark a, um, some excitement from the fish as well. So a short history of fly fishing. Um, kind of debatable, but most people think it started in 2 BC uh, with the Macedonians. So there's accounts um, in Rome of people fishing with artificial flies uh, and woven lines of different sorts, uh, mostly animal hairs. And from there, uh, the next time fly fishing kind of pops up in, in popular cultures in the 1600s in the UK, um, especially with the book, The Complete Angler, uh, which was written actually as more of a guide um, to be a, a complete Anglican, uh, the, the most popular church, um, church during that time. So there's kind of that, that spirituality tie you sometimes hear with fly fishing um, was already popular even in the 1600s. Um, 1700s, 1900s, we see the expansion west into the US and the New World. Um, so as people kind of start heading west and the first mountain men, uh, they're regularly fly fishing. And you've probably seen those old pictures of like the, the big stringers or logs full of trout um, where they were harvesting everything. And with that, with that kind of um, expansion west and, and conquering of, the, of nature, um, there came a, a, a considerable stocking effort, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit as well. In the 1890s, fly fishing first became kind of popular in pop culture for the first time in the US in the Catskills of New York. Um, still a, a very popular fly fishing area, um, but that's where we first saw kind of the, the, the fancy dress, uh, the, the wooden creel that used to be associated with fly fishing a lot, kind of early, early uh, vests, and kind of a lot of the early fly patterns we still use today uh, in the US for trout. In 1992, the river runs through it, came out, and Brad Pitt got involved, and that changed the sport forever in the US. <laughs> um, sometimes you'll hear from folks that are, are were you a, a pre-river runs through it or post-river runs through it, fly fisher person. We're both a little younger. We're, I guess we kind of might have been pre when we were, yeah, having our parents take us around. Um, but uh, that that really popularized the sport um, and kind of, especially in the Western U.S., um, became, you know, guiding outfitters uh, kind of popped up in, in places all over the place. Um, and a, a, a bigger industry around fly fishing formed uh, with much more modern rod makers and, and modern waders and equipment and women's equipment um, that previously wasn't very much uh, women's equipment or, or interest from women in the sport. Um, thanks, Brad Pitt. <laughs> um, and here we are kind of 2000s, late 90s um, with the, the, the popularity of outdoor sports and the internet, um, fly fishing films, kind of like ski films are, are pretty common now. And so it kind of revitalized past uh, the baby boomer and older um, to, to getting more younger people into the sport um, and kind of became more of a adventurous, um, kind of more appealing to a younger crowd, more, more similar to the rest of the outdoor industry and what they push. Um, but let's all be serious. Fly fishing is a really dorky sport. Uh, and we're going to get kind of into why. Um, and it's because it's very peaceful. It requires you to concentrate on nature. Um, so while it can take you on all these adventures around the world and give you adrenaline rushes at its most basic, it's simple, requires kind of a scientific observatory mind. Um, and so it's it appeals to people that are are kind of a little dorky. <laughs> um, and then COVID was the next thing that kind of popped up and I'll turn it over to Jake to talk about fly fishing pre COVID and post COVID. Right. So as uh, Rob mentioned, what do you, or Bill, what, what was your um, 
kind of the sentiment around fly fishing 20 years ago? What, what was it like to the to the general public? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think it was it was nerdy. There was people with, you know, ab absurd amounts of gear and funny things on their contraptions on their face. And they just had wild ideas pre the Internet. It was hard to come up with um, information. Um, so it was it was definitely um, just kind of a funny thing. In fact, we have a, a picture of Bill right here. Um, that's Bill in real time in 1975. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so now we go po post COVID and yeah, let's see here. And all of a sudden fly fishing has become, as you can see, it's delightful. We have models and people fishing and, and that's another picture of Bill over here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's changed. The game's changed. It's the internet, people getting into the outdoors because of COVID. It's, I'm joking about it, but it's a blessing in disguise. It's really cool to see young people excited about the sport, to see um, um, just a lot of exuberance about it. Um, so yeah, it's changing and it's, it's um, we'll see where it goes from here, but, but we're, we're happy. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's Bill, kind of the in-between <laughs> times. Um, so the way that I like to present fly fishing to people and uh, I know I've spoken about this with Bill on the river and I probably mentioned it to Juliana as well. Um, I like to think that there's three phases in fly fishing. Uh, the first phase is is you learn the basics and, and, and learn that it's fun and you, and you learn um, you know what great recreation it is. Um, you learn how to cast, you learn how to tie on your fly, um, you learn how to read the water a little bit uh, and get a, a proper drift. Um, and you're going to catch fish once you learn those, those basic steps. Um, the second is ecology and conservation. Once you start kind of realizing and don't have to think so much about, you know, where the fly is going, where the drift is going, you start to realize that what's going on below the water, but even more so what's going on immediately outside the water is, is going to affect your, your fishing day. Um, and with that, you naturally get interested in the ecology. And from ecology, you naturally get interested in the conservation. And hey, this, this is what makes a good trout stream. Um, it's not just clean, cold water. Uh, there needs to be certain other elements there as well. And then the third, um, you start to get excited um, about going to your favorite stream. Maybe you figured it out a little bit. Uh, maybe you start looking farther afield. Um, but it's really an opportunity to explore and travel outside. Uh, and especially we're so fortunate here to have so many different trout streams and, and lakes and ponds around. Um, trout don't live in ugly places. That's a fact. So going trout fishing is going to take you to some of the most beautiful places in the immediate area, uh, but also around the world. Can anybody recognize this stream? Below Chama. Yeah. It's the, the Imbudo River. The canyon, yep. So after we learn kind of the basics of, of casting and mending the line and, and getting natural drifts, you start to realize, hey, it's important what these trout eat. And uh, what they eat depends completely on the environment in the stream and around it. Uh, anybody know what type of fly that is? Yeah, awesome. That's a salmon fly. That's like the, the, the filet mignon of stone flies for trout. Um, they're big and juicy. Uh, that one is not a picture from around here. It's from, it's close. It's on the, the upper Rio in Colorado. But there are salmon flies in New Mexico, um, especially the Cimarron River has, has a large number of them. Um, but to be a successful fly fisherman, fly fishing and ecology are mutual. Um, as you get more and more in the sport, you start to realize like kind of, you know, beyond what they're feeding, but also just what's happening in, the, in your local environment and what's that, what that's tied to nature wise. Um, and learning about ecology, as I mentioned before, leads to conservation. And great fly fishermen and women are conservationists. And we'll talk a little bit more about local conservation towards the end of the 
the um, slideshow here, but um, I, I'd like to drive that home is that to be a great fly fisherman or fly fisherwoman, um, you really have to be an ecologist and conservationist. Exploration and travel. Um, so that, that final phase, you're kind of figured out your home water, you're ready to go look elsewhere. Thanks to river runs through it and thanks to kind of the, the development since the, the 80s, 90s in fly fishing, you can literally catch almost any species in the world on a fly rod. Um, so anybody know what, what either of these are? Yeah, peacock bass and uh, no, it's a, it's a blue tilapia. Um, so fly fishing can take you to places you, you wouldn't otherwise visit. Obviously, as I mentioned with trout, they only live in spectacular places. Um, so great to go explore. Um, some of these other species will take you to places you'd never expect to be. So this is in, in Miami, in the, the, the flood control canals uh, behind people's houses, um, which I would never ever go and explore if I didn't know there was fishing there. Um, and, and one of the cooler fisheries in the US, it's kind of a big aquarium of, of things people have placed in there. Uh, along with the native species. Um, and fishing is one of the world's universal languages. Um, so in my personal life, I've, I've been able to use fishing to, to explore places, to, to, to get to places and, and go into people's households um, because they're interested in fishing too. Um, so pretty neat, neat way to explore the world. It's a universal language. People everywhere around the world fish. And you'll go far with the fly rod, whether it's up in the mountains here, um, exploring down in the Rio Grande Gorge. Um, you, can, you can take it anywhere and, and it'll take you places that, that you might not have otherwise ever wanted to explore. So fishing locally. Yeah, so we're lucky here in our region. Um, it's not a, a well-known and well-talked about region, um, but it has a, excellent fishing. Um, it's maybe not as, as notor or as um, popular as you know, Montana, up northern Colorado, Wyoming, even California has a big draw, but we have some really great fishing here. It's starting to, it's starting to see a little more popularity, but everywhere is. So uh, we're lucky here. Here's, you want to do the local species part or should Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, certainly. Cool. Um, yeah, and I think um, things that we benefit from here in northern New Mexico is we have diverse um, types of fisheries. We have big rivers. We have plenty of small water. We have tailwaters below dams. Uh, we have reservoirs. We have natural lakes. Um, and we have pretty good weather so we can fish all year round and not just all year round on, on tailwaters. Um, so pretty excellent for a Western state. Uh, I don't know if there's a, a region in a Western state that has more diverse and year round fishing opportunities than we have here. Uh, and as Jake said, it's, it's, it's gained in popularity here, but compared to a lot of other places, um, we have relatively unpressured fisheries, which is fantastic. Um, so our local species, the most common fish that we'll run into, everybody know, or anybody know what these two are? Brown trout, yeah, yeah. So brown trout, um, in the history of, of fly fishing slide that was a little while back there, uh, we talked about that Western expansion and with those settlers, uh, mostly being from Europe, um, depleting the, the local native fisheries, uh, but also just longing for the taste of brown trout. I don't know why anybody would long for that taste. Uh, they brought them with them and stocked them throughout the West. Uh, brown trout, and then uh, a few years later, as people, more people from the East moved West, they brought brook trout with them, the native trout to the East Coast. Um, so all the way back until the, the kind of late 1700s, mid 1700s, um, we were stocking fish across the US. Uh, and so brown trout aren't a native fish um, to Northern New Mexico. Um, they're from largely from Germany, uh, the British Isles, um, kind of moving a little bit into to Asia, uh, but most of the ones that we have uh, in New Mexico were either of German or Scottish heritage. Um, and they proliferate. So we have them in our streams. They're kind of the biggest and meanest. They're very toothy. Um, they're, they're very mean. They'll kind of push other fish around. Um, so they've done really well here. And they're a little bit more temperature tolerant um, than our native species. So with, with the warming climate, uh, we find them in more and more places. Um, 
on the right here is uh, rainbow trout. Um, also not native to New Mexico. A lot of people don't realize that, but native to the Pacific um, and brought in from the Pacific uh, to New Mexico. Um, and this is the most common fish that is stocked by the state as well. So if you run into a, a fish that the state place, um, the Chama and the Rio Grande, especially it's, it's a rainbow trout. And then we have these super cool fish called cut bows, which are a hybridization of our native uh, cutthroat trout and a rainbow trout. Um, and we have good populations of them on the Rio Grande uh, and Chama rivers, and as well as some other small streams. I'll, I'll say something about those. The cut, the cut bows are really cool, as Rob said. Um, so you, if you catch one out there, if you're out there fishing and you happen to come across one, you can kind of notice that this one has some spotting a little bit more towards the tail, just like the, the fish in the aquarium out here. You'll notice that as well. That's a true telltale sign of a cutthroat. And you'll notice too that it's not a, a stocked fish by oft, oftentimes the fins are um, on a stocked trout are, are kind of worn out a little bit from the pens that they're raised in. So that's, that's a nice way to know kind of what you're catching. If you happen to catch something, you're like, whoa, this one looks kind of cool and happens to be um, a, cut, a cut bow. That's, that's how you notice it. The other marking that you might notice is right here um, underneath their gill plate, there's, um, there's a, um, a little bit of a marking. Um, that's kind of not as pronounced as a true cutthroat, like a, a purebred, but it's it's still there. And so these these would be our our local trout species, the the Rio Grande cutthroat. Um, and you can kind of see on the picture uh, to the the left um, a little bit of that orange cut underneath, and why they're called cutthroats. Um, super neat fish, um, cutthroat trout uh, evolved in the Pacific. Uh, and ended up kind of spread throughout the West. But the Rio Grande cutthroat exists on the Eastern side of the Continental Divide. So at some, sometime during geologic history, it actually jumped the Continental Divide uh, over to this side um, with, I think, how many cut, there's 14 plus, cut, 14, 16 cutthroat species. That sounds about right, I'm not sure exactly. But. And there's only, there's only three that ever crossed over on this side, the Rio Grande cutthroat, uh, the Yellowstone cutthroat, and the Greenback cutthroat in Colorado. I think we did have a question here too. Yeah. yeah. Are they cut though sterile or can they reproduce? They can reproduce. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So the question was, are cut bows sterile? And can they reproduce? It's a great question. And they, they can naturally reproduce. There's a pretty healthy population of them in the Rio Grande. And I think of all the, the cutthroat trout species, the Rio Grande represents the geography um, better than any other. Uh, native cutthroat from where it's from with its kind of bright orange, almost kind of sunsetty, uh, and kind of tops are a little bit alpine glow. Um, I think they're, they're the most beautiful of the cutthroat species and, and really fit um, the, their natural environment here in kind of an artistic way. Um, we're fortunate they're, they're, they're fairly common, um, but that being said, they're, they're in less than 10% of their historic range uh, in New Mexico and Southern Colorado. Um, and there's ongoing efforts to, to reintroduce them and to, to better shore up habitat for them. And they're kind of on the population rebound. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Val Vidal and the efforts up there. Um, but a, a, a major conservation interest in the area and one that especially in the last five years has received a lot more interest uh, and funding, so it's exciting to see them getting placed back where they should be or protected from uh, encroaching non-native fish. Uh, we also have uh, the Colorado cutthroat, um, which is that kind of redder fish on the left there, and that's in southern Colorado um, on the other side of the divide. So anything that runs into the San Juan or the Colorado River, um, they're they're Colorado cutthroat versus San, or versus Rio Grande cutthroat. And it can be, you know, as sharp as a, a couple hundred feet in elevation change that separates their drainages, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then we have our, our friends from the east, the brook trout. Um, and that's the, the fish on the right there. Um, introduced uh, from settlers from the east coast, largely anywhere there was mining, um, they seem to bring them with them. Um, 
we don't have a lot of streams with them in New Mexico, which kind of speaks to the level of development and expansion or lack of it um, compared to Colorado where they're, they're pretty abundant and spread out up high. Um, but they do really, really well in, in high alpine streams uh, and outcompete our native cutthroat. Yeah. Um, just mentioned elevation. Is that the determining factor in, say, a specific river in terms of the populations that change over the course of that river? Sure. Yeah, so the question was, um, is elevation the, the specific factor uh, in determining what species live uh, in a river? And that certainly is, is, is one of the major, if not the major um, factor that determines trout populations nowadays. Um, and that's elevation in combination, I'd say, with uh, introduction of species. So if there's brown trout in a stream, there's not gonna be many other species around. Uh, other than rainbows or, or cut, cut those. So I know of rivers that go a mile or two at least the fish and scuppers, rainbows, then a mile or two of brown, then a mile or two, but then beyond cut those. Yeah, totally. Certainly. Yeah, the, um, so the, um, the, the, what, sorry, I'm going to ask your name real quick. Andrew, so Andrew mentioned he knows of rivers that where there'll be a, a mile or two of browns and a mile or two of rainbows and a mile or two of cut those way up high or cutthroat way up high. And that's pretty common. So brown trout often occupy kind of the lower reaches of a stream. They're, they're far more temperature tolerant than other trout. They, they kind of thrive in warmer temperatures. Um, and rainbows kind of bridge that gap between our native trout and brook trout um, in those kind of middle reaches. Um, and that's, that's kind of the 10% of where Rio Grande cutthroat and Colorado cutthroat, I think, is only like 7 or 8% of their historic habitat have been pushed all the way up to the high elevation parts of streams. Um, yeah, certainly, great question. Um, the great thing with brook trout, uh, I know many folks in this room uh, are backpackers. Um, they often populate streams in extreme abundance and in places like that, um, it's totally welcome to take them for dinner and they're by far the best tasting of all trout in my opinion. Because uh, they're related to Arctic char. They're in the char family. They're not actually a trout. So they have that orange flesh if you like salmon or Arctic char. We also have some warm water species um, around here, especially on the Rio Grande, uh, a little bit on the Chama as well. Um, anybody know what that fish on the right is? Or it would be your left? Yeah, got a smallmouth bass and a northern pike. And so these, these are both from the, the Rio Grande. Um, the smallmouth bass were introduced into Cochiti at some point. Uh, and they come up the river uh, kind of all the way to Pilar. Um, and the pike likely came from reservoirs in the San Luis Valley in Colorado and have made their way down, um, but also might have been thrown in in Cochiti at some point as well. Um, and just kind of an added bonus, um, there's always, you know, in fishing circles, debates about the impacts of these warm water fish on our trout fisheries. At least on the Rio Grande, I'd say it, it kind of get along. Um, the pike, pike definitely will eat trout, the bass definitely will eat trout, but wherever we're at right now with climate stuff and, and, and stream flows, it seems like it's in an okay balance. So I'll kind of enjoy them while we can, enjoy it all while we can. Uh, anybody know what, what these, this one ugly and one pretty fish are? <laughs> yes, that's a common carp. Another introduction from, from Europe and Asia uh, that's pretty prolific throughout the U.S. Um, and that's a, a pretty nice one from the Rio, not too far from Española uh, that Jake caught. Um, and then did you know there's salmon in New Mexico? We have kokanee salmon that are stocked in a few of our reservoirs. Um, and uh, especially on the, the upper Chama, there's a little bit of a run a few other places. So kind of a neat fish to, to have here. Okay, now this is the one I was a little more prepared for. Ish, we're just kind of winging it, so somewhat prepared. Um, cool. So, like we said, we have a, a amazing abundance of different types of fishing, and a big map, big state, lots of places to fish. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about a few of the different ones that are the most notable. So I'm sure I don't know if there's anyone in this room, you know, in this crowd, the Mountaineers, who hasn't seen this sign. Um, so the Jemez area, right in your back door, um, there's 
a bunch of different rivers. I mean, we've got the Saboya, the Los Vacas. I think it was Andy that was saying he caught like a 18 inch brown out of the Jaramillo, was it, in the caldera? That's, that's incredible. So La Jara, okay. Um, yeah, of course, the San Antonio and the, and the, and the Jemez, itself, Jemez River itself. So you guys are lucky to have something right out your backyard. Um, Chama, who here has been to Chama, the town of Chama? Almost everybody, great. Um, so yeah, this is probably up there. The Rio Grande and the Rio Chama are probably my favorite rivers in the area. They're our biggest, biggest water. Um, and the Rio Chama in particular is probably the most diverse fishery that we have, maybe one of the most diverse fisheries in the West in terms of the different characteristics as you move from the headwaters down towards um, where it joins the Rio Grande near Española. So I might be able to go back and check out. Um, I was just going to kind of point around. Yeah, so here's the Chama. Here's Abiquiu Reservoir. And then the headwaters are just above here in Colorado. Not very many miles, maybe 10 miles or so up above the, um, the, the border. So up there, it's beautiful. It looks more like it does, you know, in, in your high country here. Um, classic, what they call a Western Rocky Mountain freestone stream. So it's dependent on so many factors, snow melt and, um, you know, what, what the stream flow is doing at any given day. So you kind of want to call Rob up if you, if you want to go up there. It's harder to predict. Um, so this section here is a little lower down. It's still above any of the reservoirs. So Elvado is the first reservoir that impounds the Chama. This is up above there a little ways, but you can see the, the River Canyon starts to, starts to deepen a little bit. It goes through kind of a sandstone um, geology. And there's these big giant blocks that kind of fall off the, the cliff side and create these big pools. Um, and it's, it's a great trout fishery, but it's a, it's a finicky one. It gets warm in the summer. It has a lot of carp, a lot of competition from other species. Um, but it's still some great trout fishing if you catch it right. And amazing hatches, um, gl gl glorious hatches. Um, the picture here with Paige, someone who's special to me, um, is a um, picture in a similar section. It's um, a little bit above Heron, Heron Lake. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a similar one. Um, I'll go a little bit more about the Rio Chama here. We don't have any photos of it, but um, once the Rio Chama gets impounded in El Vado, beneath El Vado Dam is another one of our more famous fisheries. It's, um, it was where the state record brown trout was caught. Um, I think the story was that somebody, an old school angler, had to put a hook through a mouse and put on a shingle and put the shingle out onto the current into the current and let it float out into a, into a giant pool and pulled the poor little mouse off the, off the shingle and a big brown trout came and ate it. So that's how they caught that one. At least that's the story. Bill told us to lie about stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the actual story that I have heard. So anyway, that section below Alvado Dam is, um, is very temperamental in that it's, it's dictated by the stream flows of what the the people decide they want to do with it. The Army Corps of Engineers has a say, Albuquerque Irrigation District has a say in where the water comes from. So um, it's a dynamic fishery, but if you catch it when the, fl when the flows are not really, really high, um, you have a chance at a great day there. Um, it's murky. Some people show up at the water, at the river and they look at the water and go like, what the, what are we fishing in? It's kind of muddy. And, and you go, you know what? That's just how it is. And the fish have totally adapted. So it's, it's pretty incredible to, to be fishing in waters like this, perfectly crystal clear, you know, maybe five miles away, and then going down below the dam and having it be really silty, really murky, but yet the fishing is, is kind of, you know, just as good. Or, you know, so it's a very interesting one there. So going down, I don't know if you guys have done the Chama Wilderness section ever, but that's something that the mountaineers might want to look into. It's, it's a gorgeous section. Uh, there becomes fewer and fewer trout as you move away from the dam because the dam will mitigate water temperatures. So the, the way that the outlet works in the dam function is that there's kind of a constant place where the water is released from in the, in the water column of the dam. So from, from the top to the bottom, the water's always coming out the bottom. 
Um, and so the temperatures are, are, are then mitigated by the atmospheric conditions above it. So you get good, better winter fishing and also better summer fishing. So those warmer temperatures I mentioned um, aren't as prolific or they don't cause problems as much for trout um, in, the, in the summertime. So yeah, tailwaters is what those are called. And if, you're, if it's really, really hot, you might wanna look for a dam to fish under because that can help. Um, going down from El Vado, I went through the Wilderness Canyon. The next place the water gets impounded is Abiquiu Reservoir. And then below Abiquiu Reservoir is a very similar fishery as El Vado. And it's probably our most common winter fishery. So a lot of, a lot of guides and anglers like to go below El Vado in the wintertime. It runs clear. And in the summertime, it gets kind of muddy and, and more difficult. But um, that's, a, that's a good one. All right, the Rio Grande. So this river is incredible. I mean, to have this resource at our disposal is, is amazing. Uh, from like the Colorado state line, pretty much all the way to Velarde, there's trout. Um, and between, th between those two points, um, it's just an incredibly diverse place to fish. You have the gorge, of course, uh, which is some of the most inhospitable, hardest access uh, places to fish I could think of. You're, you're hiking in, you know, up to 600 feet elevation gain in and out. And um, I hope some of you guys have fished there because it's, it's one of the coolest places to go. Um, boulder strewn because of the, the basalt blocks that kind of tumble down, create rapids, runs. And then probably the most beneficial thing in, inside the gorge up there is springs. So the springs kind of enter the river really close to where the river is actually flowing, not far from the banks, which really helps mitigate summertime water temperatures and creates kind of cold, clean, clear water, which is important for trout. Cool. Yeah, one of the, the neater things with the Rio Grande is where it starts up in Colorado by Creed and then down into South Fork. Um, it's kind of a, a very uh, northern, western stream, more similar to Montana, uh, very similar to the Conejos as well. Uh, and then once it goes past Del Norte, it kind of becomes this agricultural channel, essentially, and there's not trout in it um, anymore. But when it hits the New Mexico state line within a mile, we've got all this spring recharge um, that brings it back to life and makes it this completely wild and completely different trout stream than it was um, up in South Fork and up in Creed. Um, so it's pretty neat kind of the, the geology of the area um, and that groundwater that, that no one can really access uh, brings this stream back to life and continues for 100 plus miles downstream. This photo is here just actually near Embudo. Um, so there's fishing all through there. And um, yeah, it can be really beautiful if you get to catch it when it's clear like this and not kind of, you can see all the sediment sitting here. When that gets stirred up and gets pushed into the into the water, it can be tougher fishing. But um, there you go, some fishing tips for you. So yeah, the high elevations are, you know, the place to go in the summer. So when when we're looking for a place to fish, we're kind of thinking about so many different factors. But as a general rule, you can always kind of start low in this in this in this early spring, then move up to the higher elevations um, in the summer, and then you move back down. Um, to lower elevations in the fall. And you're just kind of finding those optimal temperatures. That's really kind of the, the basics of it. Um, trout are cold-blooded, of course, and they are gonna be susceptible to whatever temperature the water is. So when they're comfortable, they're active, they're happy. Um, when they get uncomfortable, it gets too hot or even too cold, they slow down and the fish is tougher. So um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I think, um kind of at, at its most simple and most fun, we're so lucky to have these, these high elevation fisheries. While there might not be a lot of water in them, uh, the fish have a short growing season. They usually don't see too many anglers. Um, so they're excited to hit anything that lands on the, the top of the water. Uh, so we get to fish with big dry flies, flies that float on top, uh, foam grasshoppers. Um, often we can see them in the creek already, but to have them come and eat on the surface if you've never had that experience, um, it's pretty much the, the most fun you can have in, in fly fishing, in my opinion. Um, and though the fish are, are, are typically a little smaller, 
uh, than the ones we'd see in our big rivers. Um, they're usually absolutely beautiful uh, in their own right. So um, we obviously get more chances at cutthroat up top, as we talked about before. Um, but often the, the other fish, due to the, the shorter growing season and kind of a limited um, diet, they kind of get more colorful and more beautiful as well. Um, so local conservation, uh, we're, we're fortunate to have um, a, a fairly active conservation community, even though you know a low population of folks involved. Um, three groups that are, are, are pretty active in the area, um, the Enchanted Circle chapter of Toronto Limited, um, which is kind of vaguely, if you live uh, kind of Velarde North, um, that's the, the group to be involved with in the Truchas chapter uh, is kind of Velarde South uh, to Albuquerque. Um, both chapters of a national organization, Trout Unlimited, um, really the guys that do stuff on the ground. I'm a board member for the Enchanted Circle um, chapter um, and kind of mix of other fishing guides um, and then folks that are just interested either in, in improving the trout fishing, protecting what they have, or not even fishermen or fisherwomen um, just want to see healthy local watersheds for either birds or, or plants um, for themselves. Um, so kind of neat. And then New Mexico Trout, which is a, a state organization. Um, so kind of hot topics in conservation in the area. Um, stream access uh, was a big one in the past few months. Um, so we have a new ruling from the Attorney General uh, and the, the federal courts decided to, to not take up um, challenges to that where we have greatly improved stream access in the state. So now if you access a stream within the high water mark from a public piece of land, you're good to go as long as you stay below that high water mark. So more similar to Montana or Idaho than other Western states. So that's a, a, a big victory for access. Um, there's conservation concerns um, with private fisheries that might have invested in their, their waters. Um, but I think overall, um, a, a great benefit for the public of New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so that, that that's a good question that that the, the Attorney General doesn't really know <laughs> well either. Um, but I think it's safe to assume uh, if you find find a stream where runoff would be. So if you see debris and branches uh, from that high water period, just stay below that, and you're and you're good to go. Yeah. Um, it's also a little bit confusing for everyone right now. They it's such a new, you know process that they've gone through and it's such a it's it's so new to everybody that it's it's kind of vague um so i think it will get more clarity from from you know the courts hopefully especially the courts but um we'll get more clarity on that as things progress but they they say it kind of it's like if your boots are kind of wet most of the time you're not tromping around up higher in the in the grasses and things where where people live you're probably okay so yes that's absolutely yeah, absolutely Yes, the question was, do you have to enter from public access? And that's, that's a yes. And uh, in no way uh, will me or Jake bail you out of, of jail or <laughs> um, a testy situation with a rancher. Um, but I think some folks are, are probably gonna test it more and more this summer. Um, but it's, it's great to know that you're now safe to, to get out there and, and wade without worry. Um, uh, native trout and trout reintroduction, um, a big, um, conservation goal in the area, uh, reintroducing the Rio Grande cut in places uh, that they weren't, and then shoring up protection. Um, in the Val Vidal, uh, if anybody goes and fishes up there, you might have noticed um, over this past two years, um, the Forest Service property on, on, uh, on the Costilla and um, on all the tributary streams there uh, had been poisoned. Um, and so the Forest Service uh, along with a number of conservation partners, um, were removing fish that they, uh, and actually Ted Turner's biologists on Vermejo, um, had determined were not 100% uh, pure DNA Rio Grande cutthroat. 
So it's a little bit of a kind of back to prehistory Jurassic Park. Um, but the goal is without those um, genetics, um, you know, the, the opportunity to, to, to reintroduce and repopulate certain other areas um, kind of diminishes. Um, they've got hundreds of miles of stream up there where we'll have pure uh, native Rio Grande trout. So, so bring your DNA kits <laughs> when you go fishing. Um, with that as well, there's, there's lots of efforts around uh, where there are Rio Grande cuts in the, the Tusas Mountains, um, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, um, to improve fish barriers, whether natural or artificial, like culverts and things like that. Um, so some work that I've personally have been involved with is on uh, the Rio Hondo, the tributaries there, um, installing um, these kind of what we call slipstream culverts, so culverts that fish can't swim up to protect the populations of, of native fish uh, in those tributaries. Unfortunately so, there's, there's always um, interest in, in different things that can harm our local waters. Um, some of the, the conservation issues in place right now um, are proposed development at Towski Valley. Um, they're proposing a kind of new base area uh, which could affect the Rio Hondo um, and hopefully not the Rio Grande. Um, but if you have any interest in that, I'd be happy to, to talk with you about that. Um, securing adequate flows um, on the Chama, this is pretty important. Um, making sure we have enough water in the river to keep it cool during the summer, uh, but also to keep those trout happy and fed during the winter so they don't all pool up in the same areas. Um, the Conejos is a, a great example. Of, of some conservation work in the past 10 years where there's been major advancements in this. Um, so with the farmers in the, the valley there, um, they've worked out an agreement uh, with the state and with conservation groups to allow a minimum winter flow, um, which is greatly benefiting the stream. Um, so kind of trading some of those summer water rights uh, for credits during the winter and uh, making sure there's enough water to keep the fish dispersed uh, to not freeze to the bottom and keep bug life happy in the Caneos. Um, and of course, as you, you, you folks are well aware, in Los Alamos fire um, is, a, is a constant problem and, and will continue to be a constant problem. Uh, and with that, um, what can be done uh, in terms of fire protection, but also shoring up sediment loads pre and post fire uh, to make sure they don't run into the streams. So there's a lot of work on the Embudo uh, and some other streams uh, in the area to do that. And then youth education. Obviously, we want more young anglers in the sport, um, especially because they become conservationists eventually. So uh, it's great to get the youth involved. Um, a couple of, of upcoming conservation events to plug. Um, a really fun one in Taos, April 14th through 16th. Um, uh, it's a kind of social fly fishing tournament and the biggest fundraiser for our local Trout Unlimited chapter up there. If you're around and have any interest, um, highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's not a, you know, a lot of, it's fly fishing. So it's not, it's not like a, um, a, a high pressure sort of situation. It's more just kind of social, have fun, raise some money for conservation, meet other fishermen or other people interested in conservation. Uh, and then kind of a really neat event uh, coming up also on that April 14th uh, is, uh, Socking cutthroat uh, in the Rio Grande and Eagle Rock Lake uh, with the state and with the Forest Service and BLM. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, one sh shameless plug, of course, we work for Artful Angler um, and we run guide trips around the, around the areas that we just mentioned. So we'd be happy to take you out. And if you want to be really cool, like like post COVID kids, call up Rob. He's he's a cool guy over here. So um, yeah, everyone's welcome. You no know, no prior experience necessary. We take beginners out all the time and we love to teach this, teach it to everybody. So um, we hope you enjoyed our presentation and um, thank you to everybody who helped us set it up. And um, there's, yeah, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. So I think that's it, right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, no, 
So it's from on on the Rio, so the question was did uh, what section of the the Val de Dal and Costilla did they they reclaim uh, and clean out um, the non-native fish, um, and so the the Rickla land, uh, the Costilla Livestock Association, um, they didn't clean that out and they didn't clean out Latir Creek, um, but it starts at the Forest Service boundary, and up uh, Comanche Creek, Ponil Creek on the other side. Um, so all of that uh, was cleared out and restocked um, this past fall. Uh, so won't be fishing this year, but next year we'll be fishing well. Uh, but we still like to go up to the Valvadal and fish the Rickla land, uh, Latir Creek, uh, some other waters up there, which weren't poisoned, uh, still have Rio Grande cutthroat in them, as well as rainbows, cutbows, and browns. Um, and just a, if you haven't been up there, it's just a cool place to fish. Um, it's like you're in, in the middle of Yellowstone, um, but not too far away from here. Um, and frankly, I think some better fishing than, than I've had in Yellowstone. Since um, most every fish that you showed pictures of, I'm sure went back into the water on harm. Could you talk a little bit about what it takes to make sure that a fish survives their, uh, their visit with you? Absolutely, yeah. So the question was, how do you properly handle trout that you catch, which is a crucial part of quality conservation practices. Um, catching a fish does have some relative amount of risk. You can catch it in the eyeball. That does happen. Um, you can kind of foul hook it. Um, but if these things do happen, it doesn't mean it's going to be fatal. It just means we have to be careful. So yeah, proper handling of fish is starts with using a net. So if you have a, a landing net, that's very useful. Um, you can net the fish. You have a place for the fish to rest in the water. Um, if you pull the fish out of the water, I like to think about counting to 10. If you, if you are out of, if you are underwater, if you count to 10, what, what, what's going to happen about that time? What would happen to you if you were underwater for 10 seconds and someone just pushed you down or something like that? You could survive, but it would be uncomfortable, right? You'd start to get stressed out. Um, and the same thing happens to fish. So if you count to 10 and the fish is still out of the water, it's time to put it back in the water. Um, and that's actually become kind of a point of contention among um, guides and, and everyone in the industry because of Instagram and social media. People are keeping fish up out of the water for photos for multiple different times, and it can stress the fish out, and eventually they can you know, die that way. So yeah, step one, use a landing net. Step two, try to keep the fish in the water as much as you can. Step three, get the hook out as quick as you can. Um, there's even a tool you can use to slide down the line so you can kind of pop the fish, the hook out really easily. And then um, step four, try to handle the fish as little as possible. So you want to make sure that their, their mucous membrane, which is an important part of the fish's biology, is maintained to, to the best quality you can. So if you're using, um, you know, some people use gloves and things, I don't really think that really helps the fish because it can kind of rub off the mucous membrane a little bit. So you can, you can handle the fish as long as you wet your hands. You know, you can hold the fish, take a picture, it's okay. Um, and then put it back in the water and make sure it can swim, swim away freely. If it starts to struggle or something, um, you wanna kind of hold the fish in the current. Um, the way that a fish <clears throat> can breathe is actually by movement. You'll notice that in a lake, fish are often just cruising around or in the aquarium, there, there's circulating water. If the, if the fish doesn't have movement oftentimes their lungs can't or their their gills excuse me can't um move water through their um their their gills as as quickly as they, they need to so um, yeah just make sure that it has a little bit of current but not be in like a lot of rushing water and then just let it go yeah and we we try and fish with barbless flies as much as possible um which uh you don't really lose um fish as, as, as much as you think not having a barb on a hook would be or, or really at all uh, and just makes the whole process of releasing the fish a lot a lot easier and smoother um, especially if you end up foul hooking by accident um, you know it's not stuck in there or releasing yourself yeah yes <laughs> and that's yeah <laughs> that's a that's a good point bill said and releasing yourself yeah it definitely it definitely it goes a long way if you you hook yourself in the ear you hook your guide in the ear um, Great, happy to field any more questions if you guys have them. All right, I can switch to a, an online question or we can take this one from in the room. Go ahead, sir. Over the 
the state record, man, I am not remembering the exact numbers, but it was gargantuan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, I think it was 32 or 36 inches or something crazy yeah. like that. And is it even bigger than that? Yeah. The Kraken in the San Juan. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, the question was, do we ever use a mouse fly? Certainly. Um, I especially like to use m- mice flies on the, the Rio Grande um, in the evening. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. No, not an actual mouse. <laughs> not an actual mouse. Um, I, yeah, there's, there's ones you can tie the size of a mouse. Um, oftentimes the fish will kind of miss the, the bigger ones. Um, so it's, it's really entertaining and fun, but if you want to catch them, you kind of tie them kind of a little bigger than the caddis flies that naturally come off there. Um, I was once in Mongolia um, uh, and was in the market in Ulaanbaatar and there was uh, a couple of fishing vendors and they had some lures that they made where they took rats they captured in the city and uh, filled them with spray foam and ran a wire through <laughs> and a hook. <laughs> and I thought about buying one and I had one in my hand, which I regret. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't because uh, uh, customs searched my bag on the way home anyway. So. Okay, so a couple of questions from online and then we can come back. Yeah. Uh, so the first one was, um, what did you mean by unpressured fisheries? Um, so when we refer to pressure, it just is a kind of a, a measurement or kind of a gauge of how many people are, are accessing that fishery. Um, so unpressured fisheries are fisheries that don't see a lot of people. So I guess for a comparison, um, if anybody's been to the San Juan kind of during the peak summer season um, where you see a lot of people, that, that's what we consider a pressured fishery uh, versus the Rio Grande where we often don't see people at all uh, in the gorge section. Yeah, um, the question was, uh, it's a little easier to, to kind of um, match what's floating on the surface in a dry fly or what's flying around in the sky. Uh, than a nymph or what's underwater. Um, so spending a lot of time fishing in the local area, we have a, a good general idea of, of what's going to be in the water at certain times of year. Um, but uh, even then, or if it's a tough day or something I recommend uh, to you guys is just picking up a rock uh, in kind of uh, a similar, what you think the, you know, an area the fish would be in and taking a look at what's crawling around on the bottom of the rock. Um, and that'll make you also kind of, you know, you'll see things under there and you'll say, oh, I know what that is. I have something that matches that or what the heck is that? Like, what, what is that thing living in here? Um, and usually you can kind of figure out what's most abundant and match uh, to your fly um, with that. Uh, in terms of kind of how things look underwater, obviously they're gonna look a lot different underwater than they do when they're floating on top. Uh, so there's a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say art, but a little bit more science in, in nymphs and, and underwater flies. Um, and there's some great resources um, online, but uh, also great to go out with a guide and, and happy to show you all our tricks and what we know. Um, or go to a fly shop. They're kind of the, the original dictionaries of, of how this stuff works. And we're fortunate to have great fly shops in the state. Uh, but one website I recommend uh, and a guy who was a PhD student while I was doing my undergrad, troutnut.com is super cool. Um, and he's an entomologist, aquatic entomologist uh, with a fisheries kind of slant uh, and has lots of pictures of underwater uh, and surface um, insects, uh, fish, other forage, uh, and sometimes will show a fly pattern that matches them. It's a pretty cool site. Yeah, I may add it to that just quickly is, um you can get as in depth as you want. That's the beautiful thing about fly fishing is you can, you can become an entomologist and you know, it can, it'll help your fly fishing for sure, but you don't have to. So to answer your question briefly, just size and color. If you see something in the water, it's floating around, or if you see something flying around, oftentimes that hatch came from nymphs under the water. So if you can kind of figure out what's under there and try to match it by size and color. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, you can get crazy with it. You could try to figure out if it's the larval stage, the pupil stage, the emerging stage. You know, there's lots of different stages of the life cycle of, a, of an insect. But um, size and color, that's, that's what you want. That's the, the basics. Yeah, that's a great point, Jake. Cool, in the back there. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so we have them kind of sparse on, on a, a number of streams. So the question was, oh, yeah. is when does the salmon fly hatch? Thanks, Jake. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're kind of kind of sparse, and we have them in, in small numbers um, on, on our on our major streams and tributaries to them. The Cimarron is the, the kind of most reliable salmon fly hatch. And that usually occurs kind of mid May, third week of May. Um, but because it's a tailwater, it all depends on what's going on with the irrigation below. And I wish I could kind of nail the week down, but um, last year I missed it. The year before I nailed it, the year before I got one day of it. So it's kind of like, uh, call, the, call the shop up there in Eagle's Nest. Uh, around that time, and and they've got the best hand hands on knowledge of what's going on. But it's a it's pretty cool because they're they're really abundant on a small stream over there. Generally, too, the salmon flies and a lot of different insects will hatch kind of as a runoff tails off as the as the waters are are um, starting to clear after runoff. So if you keep an eye on the stream flows, it's different every year, but that's about the time you're going to find, especially the salmon flies. Yeah, and the, the Conejos uh, and the upper Rio Grande in Colorado have good salmon fly populations as well. Um, and kind of range with, with runoff, but Father's Day weekend is, is kind of a good period on the, the upper Rio Grande to consider. Cool, yeah, good question. So the question is, what is the advantage of using really small hooks versus other sizes, larger sizes? And what is the range of sizes? Yeah, so... Um, Basically, what, what fly fishermen are trying to do is imitate nature. Um, so they look, go out there and they kind of poke around and try to find what the fish are feeding on. And it ha sometimes it happens to be that fish are feeding on midges, which is one of the smallest insect. It's a family diptera, the true flies, and it's it's tiny. It's like I don't know. It's like a, it's like a very similar to a mosquito. And mayflies can get really small too. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason is that the fish happen to be keying in on that. Um, sometimes that's the only food source. There's nothing else kind of happening, especially early season, like right now. Um, you know, if I'm going out in the rivers, I'm making sure I have midges, really tiny, tiny little black and gray midges, and also small mayflies. There's a pattern called betis, or um, yeah, just a really small gray mayfly. And their their size is like typically like 22 is a is a hook size. That it, it's I don't know why the hook system is like this, but um, it's the smaller the hook, the larger the number. It goes up to about 28 or 30, but that's like minuscule, it's like ridiculous. <laughs> um, but the, in the San Juan, you sometimes use a size 28 hook. But um, from there, 22 is like a size of mosquito. Mayflies are like, you know, 18, 20, 18, maybe 16. Sometimes there's some drakes, Western gray drakes and green drakes that are bigger. Um, but it goes up from there. So the hook size is just dependent on, you know, what you're trying to imitate. It can be, it just depends on kind of what's going on in the river system at that given day. Um, if there's, I wouldn't necessarily say going smaller is always going to catch more, um, but, or get more, more um, attention or strikes, but um, it can, uh, especially, I'm, I'm never fishing super tiny flies if the water's muddy. That's one thing I'm usually going bigger. Um, so if it's muddy, that kind of that whole stuff goes out the window a little bit. But um, yeah, if it's clear water and slower current, um, sometimes fish have a longer time, right? As the, as the fly is floating by, they can kind of look at it a little more and then go, oh, no, that's not looking good to me. So sometimes going smaller can, can fool them a little easier. So. And sometimes a, a good approach when you first get to a stream is to try a larger fly and a smaller fly. Um, so one that kind of can gain some attraction and one that might be what they're actually feeding on that day. So we have about five minutes before it's very fast. Okay. So maybe one more. Yes, I definitely want to ask one more question. We had a couple of questions come in about the access um, legislation and, and issues that you that you mentioned last. Um, First one, what, what's the best resource? Is it website or newspaper or something else uh, to keep up with the plans for development at Taos Ski Valley? Uh, backcountry ski access to Williams Lake and Wheeler Peak seem to be a question for this development as well. Yeah, there's been a little bit of coverage in, in Taos News, but not a lot. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're super interested, I'd shoot me an email, troutrobert at gmail, and I'd, I'd be happy to, to plug you in with um, the resources that we're sharing 
up there. Um, there's a comment period right now on their draft environmental assessment uh, for the proposed developments that I believe closes on April 9th or April 10th. So if it's an area you like to use, um, if you have interest in the health of the Rio Hondo uh, and the, the Rio Grande uh, downstream, um, it'd be great to get more comments to the Forest Service a la uh, we should do a little better research on, on the proposed uh, development and potential impacts uh, of them on the watershed. I'd like to thank our speakers for coming and sharing so much information. Okay, yes, we're going to do another thank you, thank you for our, our speakers. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rob and Jake, for sharing so much about fly fishing with us tonight. Um, and uh, if you're interested in attending more peak programs, we just released everything for our next quarter. So that's April, May, and June. Watch out for some Mountaineers things in there as well. Uh, and we hope to see you at our Earth Day Festival coming up in April and any kiddos at the summer camps and so much more. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us and have a good night. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And hopefully see some of you guys fishing. Come on out with us. <laughs>